very humbling to, to be with the two of you right before Pesach, where the Haggadah outlines this journey from slavery to freedom. You've both lived that journey profoundly, really offered your lives for it, and almost had to give, all but had to give them, and have come through to establish in different fields institutions that fight for and protect human freedoms. I wanted to start by asking each of you for a moment on that journey, slavery to freedom, that is particularly important to you. Albi, can I ask you first? It, it's not the journey for me. Uh, it's the journeys right. in history, in continents, different people. Uh, and we're seeing it now in the world yeah, all the Pesach time. Pesach for me, Pesach for me uh, is not essentially an historic event uh, uh, captured in, in the, the writings. Uh, I only read the book in English when I was in solitary confinement in prison in South Africa, uh, age 26, I think. So I didn't grow up in a biblical tradition at all, but I knew Pesach because I would go to my Auntie Rosie and, and my Uncle Eli and I'd meet all my cousins and we'd have a f good fun time together, Pesach and Rosh Hashanah. Uh, and it had to do with conviviality uh, and family and food uh, and, and, and a strong sense of togetherness in that sense rather than an ancient historic moment my historic moments were more related to my mom and my dad fighting in South Africa for workers uh, for, against racism. Uh, uh, so it, it was, uh, in that sense, almost a disconnect. Then, strangely, the historic meaning of, of, of Pesach came to me more in the United States, which I would visit quite often. Now I'm, I'm, I'm in exile. Uh, I'm a law professor, I'm a judge, uh, and I would quite often end up in the U.S. round about Pesach time. And my first shock actually was that Pesach wasn't on a fixed night, that they'd have lots of different nights so that you could have your family thing and then your feminist thing and your anti-racist thing and your different thing each time. Now, I, I <laughs> in a sense, was more orthodox in my... Uh, uh, you know, in, in my understanding, you, you can't split it up. And I still remember one evening somebody saying, why is this night different from every other night? And he said, but it's just like last night. And my lawyer's brain said, it's the only night that's just like last night. It was like <laughs> a legal <laughs> a response to that. Then I, I remember also very vividly, uh, people discovered I gave a talk in San Francisco at the university uh, and somebody picked up from my name that I'm Jewish and said they're having a Seder the next night would I like to come and I said sure and I'm there and it was very orthodox that's okay it goes on and on and on but I had one terrible moment they're passing the Haggadah around and it comes to the plagues and I'm thinking I can't I can't read the plague about the firstborn being smitten. I can't. I'm choking, you know, and I don't want to be rude. And very fortunately for me, and I'm counting the number of things and it's going to come to me, somebody, I don't know, dropped out and I was just before. So I was able <laughs> so to you, get So you through. only had darkness. <laughs> only had darkness, yes. <laughs> I had darkness and sure. You know, that wasn't left to me. So, as you can see, uh, and then the other thing was, somewhere along the line, I learned the Paul Robeson song. Let my people go. And, and I would sing that when I got no. back to South Africa. And I'd be invited not to read the Haggadah, but to say, uh, was it when... When Israel when was, was in Egypt's Egypt. land. When Let Israel my... was in Egypt's land. Let my people go. And I could sing it quite well. So that was, in a sense, my reconciliation. Uh, my reconciliation with, 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 the, with, with, with the occasion. Seder. We always begin our Seder every year with that song. 
okay. with everybody. Hmm. No, I, th I think of the historic as like an ancient narrative into which we weave our personal narratives, the narratives of the Jewish people, of other peoples, of other struggles. So it becomes a multi, a kind of multi-threaded chord through it. John, what about you, that journey? And of course, you know, your book, When They Came For Me, I think it was almost coming out for last Pesach. Um, I thought to, to introduce this so that people understand what a mad world we grew up in. I mean, it was an entirely bizarre society, white South Africa. And its desperation was measured by the full extent of its hypocrisy. And the quality of hypocrisy was at its most extreme in Jewish life at Pesach. Because we would sit down to celebrate freedom and our emancipation from slavery surrounded by black slaves. Now, of course, they weren't called slaves. They were given a salary, they had a wage, they, but they lived in pokey hovels behind our houses and they waited on us. And there they were helping us to celebrate being free. I couldn't cope with this. It was so crazy. A defining moment for me was, I was 18, maybe just 19, and at the home of a good friend who became a mentor to me. He was an art teacher named Bill Ainsley. But at his home, there was a gathering, and one of his protégés, a black artist called Dumisa Feni, was being called on by the people we were talking to. It was an interracial group. There was alcohol on the premises, which meant we were breaking two laws just by being there. And people said to him, Dumisa, why aren't you depicting life under apartheid? Isn't it the role of the artist? He got angry and angrier at being put in a box. And he said, let me tell you. And the story unfolded that was, for me, defining. He said, I was in town last week. Town meant the, the central business district. And he saw, said, I saw a chain gang going past. Now, a chain gang was a team of prisoners, each one handcuffed to the one before and handcuffed to the one behind. And then he said, I saw a hearse going past with a coffin in it. And these men all wanted to take their hats off. But they couldn't because they were chained to each other. And they struggled, and as they struggled, the guards started shouting at them. And they were defiant. They came together so that they could lift their hands up, made a small circle, all took their hats off, gave their respect to the hearse passing, and the policeman followed them in doing just the same. There, he said, the artist, that's the moment for an artist to capture the iniquity of slavery. His work, you sought to have him uh, put up in the new constitutional court. And, and I tell that story on film about, uh, I say that he didn't show spears and bombs and raise fists. Uh, he showed the sense of humanity, uh, the vulnerability of people, uh, and people who lifted their hats when they were in prison mm. as the hearse came by. Uh, and I said, that's what we try to do on the court when we defend the Bill of Rights. It's that spirit that informs us, our, our souls, as we are judging. I have to say that not living amidst apartheid, I still can't shake the feeling of injustice when we sit down to the Seder and that in ways that are not necessarily directly palpable. Yeah. There is this, this, the injustice is present even at the table. There's a moment in the Haggadah that often puzzles me where rabbinic tradition interprets the words of the Torah. This was the destruction of family life. People were isolated from their families and made and enslaved, incomparably more extreme, but you've both experienced solitary confinement, isolation, torture. 
You've both written about it. You've both manifested a level of courage that is beyond the imagination of people like me who have not been anywhere near such places. I don't know, I'm coming to you first, John. Is there, I have your book in my hands when they came for me, The Hidden Diary of an Apartheid Prisoner. Can I ask you about the meaning of reading the Bible in prison? You talk about, you write about it on several points. The first was the unforeseen and, at the time, incomprehensible gift of generosity that came to me from one of four policemen who arrested me when they took me to my home and took the place apart. There were things they seized. I had quite a lot of books to do with Marx as well as Freud. I was reading widely. I'd been abroad for a year to the States on a scholarship and had come back with a lot of literature that other people didn't have access to. And um, they seized all this stuff. Not Freud, but all the marks that I had on my shelves. And one of the policemen picked up my little school Bible off the bookshelf and he put it in my hand and he said, keep this with you. You'll need it where you're going. And I had no idea why. It, it was, I was in denial. It was beyond me that I might end up in um, the hanging jail, Pretoria local prison. The mornings were the most difficult of all. And I read from the New Testament because you could gain access to the redemptive words of Jesus in the Gospels. And I found those sentiments accessible and touching in evoking a sense of mercy and compassion. I read from our Bible in the afternoon. Much of it was familiar to me from my own bar mitzvah education. I must confess, I found the stories of vengeance, retribution and bloodshed appalling. And they coloured my terrible dreams at night. There are, there are words from Isaiah I came across that were part of our everyday life in Shul. We, we recite them here in this, in this building every Saturday. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Um, I knew these words. I'd been to the States and I'd been at um, the Security Council as in, their, in their visitors' gallery during the Six Day War when the whole world was in turmoil. And I found these words from Isaiah um, beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks emblazoned on the wall of the United Nations Plaza facing the building. These were the words I recalled and struggled with in prison because listening as I did in the early hours of the morning to the condemned singing before their executions it was hard to hold on to the redemptive message of Isaiah. I'm going to go to you, Alfie. Hard to hold on to hope, to hold on to a redemptive message. I don't know if you were in the same... No, in the so same, we were in different, different cities, in different cells. Uh, John's circumstances were much more dire than mine. Um, you know, it was some years later and the regime had become more and more brutal, brutal and... and uh, there were fewer constraints. So I, I was amongst the very first generation to be thrown to solitary confinement. Uh, and the one book we were allowed, it wasn't given to me by one of the police, the only book was the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, and uh, sitting on the floor, nothing to do, no one to speak to, nothing happening. Uh, three times a day, some food is pushed in and you're just alone. And it's terrible, it's hell, it's hellish. Uh, and this is the one thing I can do is to read. So I rationed myself, uh, and I was completely unfamiliar. Uh, had never been schooled or trained. I grew up in a very secular home. And uh, I started at the beginning with the two columns, and I, I, I kept myself to two and a half pages a day. I didn't know if I'd be in there forever. I didn't want to get through too quickly. 
and uh, in a sense like John, and we haven't had this discussion before, uh, I was hoping for consolation, for warmth, for love. Uh, and I read about smiting and being smitten down sometimes to the last dog and chicken. Uh, and, and it's a very harsh world and environment uh, and it's a very punitive world. Uh, and then, oh, at last, Solomon and the Song of Songs and this beauty. It's beautiful. Uh, and, and maybe because the rest had been so harsh, this was especially lovely to me. And then it's back into the, the trauma and then the prophets and Isaiah. Wow. That's what I wanted. You know, the, 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 the cadences of the, the Psalms and the Song of Songs, very beautiful and lovely, and the beauty and the power and the courage and the vision, the millenarian vision, has never left me. And in particular, those passages uh, in, in Isaiah. The, ha the story of the Haggadah then moves on towards, I mean, I don't know how you'd feel about the word redemption. It doesn't define it. It, it, it includes a process of endeavoring to heal to heal, and, and that's a lot of the prophetic tradition as well. And you've each devoted your lives to it, but in different ways. You're, you, through the law, yes. through, being, through Nelson Mandela asking you to be key in the drafting of the Constitution and the establishment of the, of the High Court, yourself in working with victims of torture, in group psychotherapy, in, in your work around the world. In different ways, your life has been devoted to healing to redemption and I wanted to just conclude by inviting each of you to reflect on on what that means to you um, the particular yes, moment you know, in the case yes, wasn't well, a light but y yes. you are a light around the world no, no, we, we choose our words uh, and I'm often said to be very involved in forgiveness and it's not forgiveness uh, and redemption that's not what I feel uh -huh. what I feel is uh, transcendence, uh, generosity, uh, and the thing I called soft vengeance. Yes. Uh, when I got a letter, you remember letters, the things we used to <laughs> lick the stamps and so on, lying in the hospital bed, London Hospital, not too far from here, recovering. Don't worry, Comrade Albie, we will avenge you, signed uh, Comrade Bobby Pillay. That's in your the soft vengeance of a freedom fighter. Right. Yeah. This is after you were blown up and you lost an arm and a die. Yes. Right. So yes. a car bomb blew me up. I lost this arm, sight in one eye. I'm recovering. And I think, is that what we're fighting for? To cut off the arm blind in one eye? But if we get freedom, if we get democracy, if we get the rule of law, that will be my soft vengeance. Roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. And that theme of soft vengeance, transcendence, if you like, uh, it, it, it's not being nice, it's not even loving your enemy, it's loving, it's loving living, it's loving being in the world. Helping to write the constitution was for me part of the soft vengeance. Uh, sitting on the court, voting as an equal for the first time, standing those long lines, soft vengeance. Sitting on the constitutional court upholding fundamental rights of everybody, that's soft vengeance. And that's so empowering for me not just for the other people who are not being sent to jail, it's a, we call it restorative justice, but for me, the, the Jewishness is, is a kind of almost millenarian mania, madness, uh, out of this worldness uh, of, of, of Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein uh, that goes with not having a place, but being everywhere, uh, and thinking of, of, of everywhere. Uh, and, and that enters into my soft vengeance. And it, it draws on many different sources, some I'm aware of and some I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of. Uh, uh, and I find you don't do to them what they've done to you. You don't forgive them for what they've done to you. You, you live your life according to the values that you want. And, and, and encourage other people to join in and find that space. Uh, and and uh, that to me has been very, very liberating and, and very helpful. And then I, I, I'm filled with admiration 
with people like John, who are also helping people to find the space, but following a completely different yes. route and, and, and journey. But also it's a form of transcendence, turning negativity into positivity. I guess you could call psychotherapy, at least the form in which I practice it, a form of storytelling. So finding a voice, bearing witness, and together coming out of the shadows. These are the three cornerstones of my own practice. And it's what I write about and it's how I work. When I came here, I was lost, uh, harrowed by the experience I'd been through, displaced and without a penny. Many, many years later, I was running a big conference for one of the professional bodies I belonged to. And I persuaded them to put up a budget, this was not within the means of this organization normally, to approach you to invite you to come and open the conference for us. You gave us, for our inaugural address in 2011, an account of your work with a man called Henry. It's one of the chapters in your book, the book Jonathan's got there, The Strange Alchemy of Life and Law. He was a man who had played a part in the attempted assassination that nearly killed you. And he approached you from out of the blue, anguished, desperate, and harrowed by his own culpability. And you worked with him. He gave testimony to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's an extraordinary account. When you finished your account, you, you concluded with a brief film of the Constitutional Court you played such a key role in establishing. Just want to hear the healing element. You've told me in the past stories which have transcendence in different ways of how yeah. you enabled people to transcend emotional, psychological, spiritual, and often physical wounds mm -hmm. as well. And I, I'd like to hear you touch on that for, for your own work as well. There, I'll share with you a few brief exchanges with some of the clients I've worked with when we were setting up what's now called Freedom From Torture. It's now a major UK human rights charity. It's now a big building in Isleden Road in Islington. And we'll be there on Tuesday for an event in which I'll be speaking and I'm introducing my book to the organisation that helped me to write it and set it up. In the book, there are some short stories of healing and recovery, as I've called them, in the epilogue. And amongst the most moving is the story of a man who came here on the pretext of a family wedding from Iran. His siblings had been killed by the Revolutionary Guard. He came to us bewildered, suffering from what's called post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a strange term, but he couldn't speak. He couldn't string sentences together. He, he would start talking about his history and fall off his chair. We had to help him get back on again. He became agitated. He was in a desperate state. And I worked with him regularly, day after day, for weeks and months, until he was well enough to join one of our groups. And in the process, one of the stories he shared with me was a moment in time in a punishment cell in Evin Prison where they'd beaten an old man, he said. He was a peasant. He didn't know one politics from another. He had no reason to be there. And some circumstance and chance had led him to be arrested, which is what had happened to me. And he said, they beat him regularly. And I went to this old man and I said, old man, we can't strike them back. Don't even try. But whilst we're both here, I'm going to teach you to read and to write. And that will be our victory against them. I think those words we should conclude with, because you've both reached out with such profound, heartfelt humanity to save so many people and also to create the institutions mm. that will perpetuate a, a, a sense in which you write about justice and law 
being always in danger of being parted and often being parted in this world, but where actually law is an instrument of real justice and where there's a heartfelt endeavour to find healing and transcendence. It's a huge privilege to be with you both. Thank you. Mm -hmm.